Welcome to the dark forest Jackie and her pals will never bore us Shameless confessions about our obsession Will make us laugh and smile So let's explore the dark forest And dork down for a while Hey, it's Jackie Cation. Welcome to the Dork Forest. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com, FamilyPetAncestry.com. You're probably already there. Let's do the credits. Mike Rickberg composed and sang that song with his wife, Sarah, that you just heard. He's going to sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of the program. Patrick Brady is going to fix this audio, and Vilmos works on JackieCation.com, the website. There are many ways to support the show. The Amazon link is one. You can use an Amazon link from JackieCation.com or DorkForest.com to go to Amazon. You order like normal and it supports the show. There is a straight up donation button, PayPal or Venmo to this uh, email address that is mine, Jackie at JackieCation.com, where you can just donate to the show if you like the show a lot. I think PayPal has figured out a way to do a monthly. If you want to go monthly, please do. Other ways to support the show if you want to is you can buy merch. There's Dork Forest t-shirts and all the shirts are union made here in America. So they run a little big. Union Bayside. So if you want to look up their size chart. And then the other merch is my stand-up merch. On JackieCation.com, you can watch me do stand-up. You can look at my schedule and the stand-up merch, a couple of different t-shirts, a couple of different enamel pins, and all my CDs and my DVD. If you want to live stream my DVD, it's over there at ComedyFilmNerds.com. They have a live streaming capability, or you can get a hard copy of the DVD on my website. Oh, there are premium episodes at Bandcamp. The dorkforest.bandcamp.com has probably 10 episodes that were done live. They cost me a couple of bucks to make, so I charge you a couple of bucks. If you've run out of regular episodes, go over to ba- the dorkforest.bandcamp.com and get some more. Other than that, I say this. Let's get into the show. Hey, it's Jackie Cation in the living room. It's a return guest of Robert Hurt. Uh, you're one of my favorite guests. and the, Aww. Uh, it's, it's so funny that you could be... You could have a show called The Dork Forest, <laughs> and because there are many dorkdoms. And, my, um, my dorkdom runs deep. It, it does. It's a multifaceted... It runs wide and deep, <laughs> unlike, unlike rivers. Unlike rivers, and it's a slow-moving thing, for mm-hmm. you will watch all. Uh, Andy Ashcraft told a tale of uh, your Star Trek. Well, let's do this first. It's at Astro Rob on yes. Twitter and at Astro Rob LA on uh, Instagram. That's right. And and I'm so powerful at social media. You know, I get a post in maybe once or twice a year and you do not want to miss it. When you it don't want out. to miss it. Or you could just go and, and go and look at the six that you've posted over the last six years. <laughs> so uh, universeunplugged.org, we'll talk about it later, but it has videos uh, called The Habitable Zone. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and so universeunplugged.org is the is a fun thing that you're part of. It is terribly and, fun. Awesome right. fun videos. Awesome fun videos. And we've we've talked about the science of color. We've talked about the science of space. And today we're not going to talk about the science, though I'm sure some science will come in because mm-hmm. we're going to talk about Star Trek. Yeah. And I've had a couple episodes about Star Trek recently and this is going to be Andy was telling me the other day about how you recorded all of the Star Trek The Next Generations on VHS, mm-hmm. and you removed all of the uh, commercials. Li- live editing, it was important. Live, it was live editing. You yeah. just pause it and then keep going in the VHR, uh, mm-hmm. uh, VHS, uh, VCR. VCR. That's it. And, um, and then you finally finished, and they came out with the DVDs. It was... Uh, yeah. It's the way it was it difficult. It was it was a difficult parting. I I did they they did finally end up in the dumpster. It was oh. a, I had printed labels and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so we've talked a little bit on this show about the Star Trek Next Generation, for it was one of my favorite ones. But you said that uh, you want to talk about Deep Space Nine. I did because you know. I think diversity is important and representation. Oh, and right. You have done, you know, you've had a, a long chat about uh, Next Generation and sure. about you had another original, Voyager. Right. Or original, right. So, but I felt like, you know, there's this hole you missed and Star Trek is vast. It's, it is vast. And uh, I, you know, everyone gets asked what their favorite Star Trek is. Yeah. And, uh, and everyone who's into Star Trek, it, they, they, you always have your Star Trek. That's right. a thing that I've found. And, most often, I have found that your Star Trek is usually the one you watched when you were 
like first introduced. So for me, my Star Trek was the original series because you know that was all there. That was the only game in town. For that was a long it. Time. And and the reruns were uh, all awesome. They were on consistently, and you could watch them over and over again. And in the those dark ages for your for your younger listeners, you know, right? who, who aren't when old was farts no like Trek. me, when you know you didn't have your streaming and you didn't have your YouTube, you didn't have your DVD collection, you didn't have your VHS. You had to collection. wait till famous people died, and then they would show you all the Jimmy Stewart movies, and you're like, oh, good, someone old died, and now I get to see all those movies. I know, yeah. I mean, you had to be there in your t- <laughs> in your room in front of your TV at that right period of time. Mm-hmm. It was, it was uh, God, I, we, we, I don't we know how we survived. The, we were the, one of the first people who had a VCR, though. Did you have a VCR with the with the leash? We Yeah, the yeah, remote, with, the, with leash. the leash. Yeah, we, we actually <laughs> got it because my dad actually said, you know, it's probably time to get a VCR when we saw that Battlestar Galactica was going to drop. And so we were very oh. early adopters because we were like, <laughs> you know, we missed it with Star Trek. Wow, you come but, from a long line of on board. Oh, we, absolutely, right. And so that was, that was the first series that, well that we recorded. And that's where I learned the, uh, the t- finger twitch for mm-hmm. editing out commercials oh uh, there that you was, go that was goes way back but uh but yeah in addition to like your star trek then everyone has their their other favorite star trek i think right, right? and it's so it's not the one that just happened to be the one that first brought you in but then it's the one that maybe spoke to you on some other level yeah and so when people ask me what my favorite star trek is you know i say well of course it's the original series because right. that was my star trek uh, forever and it, yep. it's it began the uh, the ideas here but I then pivot usually to Deep Space Nine because that one hit me in a way that the other Star Treks did not, a positive way. And it was when you are developing a franchise, I think, right? The creators say, you know, we don't want to do the same thing over right. again uh, every time. And fans very much want the creators to do exactly the <laughs> same thing over again every time. And they whine wildly <laughs> if you somehow deviate from that thing that they expect from right, the series. Right. And with Deep Space Nine, I think there was an interesting choice that was made that, you know, we want to continue to explore and expand the Star Trek universe, but let's find a different way of doing it. And they took on two variations there that, that, that tweaked a lot of people the wrong way. The, first of all, they decided, let's make this a little more dark, a little more grounded. Let's, let's pull ourselves out of the living and breathing within the Federation, but put the people that we love from the Federation next to people who aren't Aren't haven't bought into the system, haven't bought into oh, the utopia, okay. and look at the tension you get when you the, the friction of taking you know the Federation is arguably like the the utopia we want to move towards in the future right. where right, right. the social problems been solved, hunger need has been solved. Yep. But what if you then are trying to sell that idea to people who are very much hungry, <laughs> very much angry, right. very much frustrated, and that was both darker in yeah. terms of Star Trek. But for me, it became a lot more interesting because it started to show how how you sell the idea, how you win people over. You know, the, the, it's the, it was the hearts and minds story of Star Trek. Right, because the, they're, they're on a... Deep Space Nine is... Uh, what I thought was weird about it was that when you talk about expanding the, the Star Trek universe and then they're in a stationary... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. vehicle. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that was the other thing that tweaked right. people. It's like, and they're in a ship that goes nowhere. That goes nowhere, so is that them exploring, except for that what they're exploring is a very Star Trek-y thing, which is to explore the socio-political um, aspects of humanity and, and, and exploration and, exactly. um, and, and that type of thing. So Deep Space Nine was a station. Mm-hmm. It was uh, orbiting a planet. Actually, Bajorans? it was originally orbiting a planet, the planet Bajor, yes. populated by Bajorans. Bajorans, you know, that's, that's it. That's some, how we love to Some name nice ourselves. earrings. And, but in the pilot episode, they discovered that there was something else interesting about the Bajoran system. There was a stable wormhole that oh, no one stable. had known about. Right, right. And once they realized, they found this this aperture, this portal that, that led to you know the opposite corner of the galaxy. Well, corner, it's a round, galaxies are round, basically. So <laughs> let's just say the opposite side of the galaxy. I'm an astronomer. I should be more precise you are in my an terminology. You are yes. But, uh, you know, you take, take the galaxy, it's about 100,000 light years across. Right. Uh, even with Star Trek technology, as we learned in Voyager, that's mm-hmm. still, you know, decades to get from one side to the other. Yep. They basically found a quick shortcut that would jump you to the other side of the galaxy like a bypass. and a whole other like a bypass and brings out a whole other area you hadn't explored the weird thing is is who who goes in a wormhole 
and is like, I wonder what's on the other side of this when you don't know. You know, that is a gutsy that 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 that, that's a pioneer right there. That's the spirit of exploration. That's very much the spirit of exploration. (laughs) The uh, and uh, science interlude. I will. I should point out wormholes have a long history in Star Trek and in science. uh, We saw our first Star Trek wormhole in Star Trek the motion picture when they fired up the brand brand new refitted warp drive for the first time, and the ship Uh gets sucked into a wormhole that nearly trashes them. Had a really cool, like blurry effect with slowing everyone down. Eighty. What was it? Eighty. What year was uh, it? Seventy. That was seventy nine. Seventy nine. Yeah. yeah, I kept thinking eighty nine, but it was seventy nine. I remember yeah. it. I liked it. But um, but in seventy nine, the idea of a wormhole was actually really fresh in science because um, uh, a, a Caltech scientist, uh, uh, Kip Thorne, physicist, had uh, you know in the seventies deduced from the mathematics of general relativity that there was this solution that allowed you to sort of connect two points in space time, which you know is physics is for points, locations, right. Right, right. homes, addresses, okay. right? Uh, <laughs> that basically interconnect them together. And, and so you could just it's... step through a portal and then you're at the other place. Wow. Uh, and the idea of this wormhole really was fresh science at that point. And the only downside of it is that while the mathematics I seem to allow it at yeah. like a very quantum, you know, tiny Theoretical. level. Uh, in order to keep one open, probably required a, a form of matter that likely can't actually physically exist in the universe. It's the the idea of a wormhole was a thing that it's this connection could exist, but as soon as you put something even as small as an electron, you start to put it into the wormhole, the mass and the, eff- the effects of the electron cause the wormhole to, you know, oh, sphincter sh- up and shut off. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, so this was the idea. It's like the math kind of allowed it, but you needed matter with really weird properties in order to allow it to actually like not shrink up while hence you try to go through it. science fiction. And hence a stable wormhole that what stays open after someone goes through it? Exactly. As they, in fact, it, in DS9, it's exactly the opposite. When you start pushing, moving closer to the wormhole, that's when it actually opens up for you. Oh, wow. Because it's actually hidden. You don't see it unless you actually go there. And so, yeah, this is sort of the inverse of what physics was telling us. And that right, was, right. but it was a nice science touch to sort of make a point that, you know, no, this is really exciting because this is stable right. and wormholes shouldn't be. Yeah. And of course. So, so that's weird. So let's go through it. Yeah. And, and that's what Deep Space Nine. And then they also, that's when they relocated the station to the wormhole because this suddenly became one of the most valuable assets in the galaxy okay. and so the station became sort of the overseer and protector of the wormhole and all the trade and and, and later Bajor. yeah and uh, yeah and so it's still in the Bajor system but the station now was the station for the wormhole not the station for the planet now there's the Bajorans and then there's the Cardassians yes which, uh, are, which aren't the bel- Cardassians I'm so social media savvy. It took me years to realize these people seem so interested in Deep Space Nine and this family. And then, like, <laughs> like I, you, these people didn't strike me. They start to be into that kind right. of sci-fi. And then I realized, oh, there's this whole other thing that I really don't there's care this about. There's Armenian family that uh, that seem to want to market their butts. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. good for them. But and they are Kardashians. They are Kardashians. And, and what and we are talking about are Kardashians. Yes, they are. And with a C and an S. <laughs> a lot of S's and a C to begin with. Yeah. So uh, the Kardashians are, but they're... Uh, Imperialists, right? They are imperialists. They are very much a, a, a state-oriented fascist society. But the other thing I found interesting, DS9, is I feel like they were the first incredibly richly developed alien species in Star Trek. Now, I mean, we had the Klingons. We got a right. lot of development in the Klingons, but there's Klingons a lot. Klingons and Vul- Vulcans. Klingons and Vulcans. Vulcans, we always, we, Spock, we got to know really well, but we didn't get to know his culture very well in the original series. Right. Uh, Klingons, we saw a little bit in the original series. We saw a lot of them in DS9, and uh, in, in Next, Next Generation, Generation yeah. and, and Worf. But the society, the Klingon society in, in Next Generation was, it was fun, but it never felt really believable to me. It felt very, it was, a, let, let's use, I hate to use it as, as comic booky in the pejorative use of comic booky. A little two dimensional. A little two dimensional. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was simplistic and caricature. Yes. So fair they enough. They get very fair angry. Enough. They kill a lot. They assassinate to go up in rank. It's, but you know, I yeah. like, so really, who, where do you, where do your crops come from? How do you, <laughs> right. you know, uh, do, do, do you, do you just. Who's teaching math? Who's teaching right. math, right? I mean, you build ships. There's got to be some scientists there, right? Right. 
The Cardassian culture became much more interesting, though, because we, we get to meet some Cardassians in depth. We spend a lot of time eventually on the Cardassian homeworld, and we, we see a system where you know people are raised to service the state. The state's more important than the individual. Uh, Cardassian trials, we learn, are, are um, you, you start a Cardassian trial already knowing the person's guilty. And oh, the point really? of the trial is just to make everyone feel good that the state wins again. Uh, it's wow. a whole psychology of the culture. Um, there are lovely. There's a there's a character. I don't think I've ever. I think I only watched the first two or three seasons. Oh, you, you missed a good with... part because it. So like so many Star Treks, I will say the first season of Deep Space Nine. Not so good. Not <laughs> nah. no no. It takes it's, a while. Everybody has to. Some of them are like really painful. Right. There are a couple beautiful nuggets in there, but uh, uh, the we have it, Hawk from uh, Spencer for Hire. Mm-hmm. He's the he, he's commander the, Cisco. He's commander the, Cisco. He's uh, starts as commander. He later is promoted. Finally, gets to be a captain, like right. all the others. But that was also interesting because we started with kind of a lower level Starfleet officer off on a station. It wasn't a captain in command of a ship. It was sort of a oh yeah you you got a bureaucrat. You're a bureaucrat. Just yeah. just to help the Bajorans finally get into the Federation. Yeah. And it was watching him grow into his role. Right. Uh, we had um, uh, Major... His, his son. You had his son, Jake. Right. Uh, who they had lost their mother, his mother, Cisco's wife, in the Battle of Wolf 359. And it was a big event that occurred in Next Generation where the oh, Borg okay. were starting to attack Earth. And we find uh-huh. out that he was on one of those ships that was destroyed by the Borg. And he and his son survived, but their, uh, the their, mom, their mom The mom died. wife died. Um He's there. Um, his first in command, though, is a Bajoran who's not Starfleet, and she's a uh, uh, major. Uh, oh, right, Major Kira. That's right. And uh, she and she's coming in. She's the angry person. She's the so the the Bajorans were an oppressed race for yes. long. The 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 Cardassians had come in. They'd conquered their world for over a hundred years, mm-hmm. and uh, Kira had been part of the Card- the, the Cardassian resistance. She, mm-hmm. the, right, I guess, the Bajoran resistance against the Cardassians. Right. But she basically lived her life as a terrorist. Right. She was blowing up depots. She was attacking. She was doing whatever she could to free her people. Right, because they were in camps. I mean, they, they literally camps. there was genocide. Yes. Yeah. And so, and this was again one of those interesting things that Star Trek could do. That uh, and, you know, this and was repeatedly does. It's so cool. You know, effectively, you've taken if you're going to map these characters back onto our world, you are now taking people who could be thought of as Palestinians, who right. are uh, fighting, or the and, Jews, or, or the, the Jews, Armenians, or the Armenians, or any of these the oppressed Sudanis. peoples who've had right. to fight against people who've come in and conquered the, what they, you know, their their worlds are. And so it's it's very seldom especially in the 80s and right. the 90s, to have a show showing the mindset of why would someone be a terrorist? What right. drives them to do these terrible things? Yeah, yeah. And a fantastic arc of her reconciling the her past and some of the dark things that she had done in the service of her people, trying to reconcile that moving forward. Right. And um, in particular, her story arc of, you know, all Cardassians are evil and horrible because of what they did to me. That's right. To actually... Growing to admire and and respect individual Cardassians. Okay, you know her arc of separating hatred of a race right. into hatred of a government and what they had done, and realizing the people are not the same thing as their race or their background. Right, and that was a really powerful story arc for that character. And was that over? Uh, like, how many seasons was Deep Space Nine? Seven seasons, just like uh, uh, Star Trek: uh, Next, Next Generation, Generation and Voyager. Also, oh, really? had, uh, they all were seven season runs. Okay, I did. I know because because I remember because there's there's many different. You know, I remember that first season of Deep Space Nine and thinking it was a lot like the bar scene in Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what are you doing? And especially with Worf's, uh, not, uh, with Quark. With Quark, the Ferengi. The Ferengi. Uh, and that's another interesting one. The Ferengi were introduced in, uh, in Next Generation as initially they were set up to be these great enemies of the Federation, but they were yeah. portrayed as incredibly they had laughable. an ear fetish. And ear fetish. They're was, very... They, Deanna they, Troy's uh, uh, mom was making out with one of them with the ear. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that episode. <laughs> you know, they again, not a really good job of, of 
world building with the Ferengi in Next right. Generation. They were very comical. They were very, uh, they were supposed to be an exaggeration of, of uh, capitalist ideals and right. uh, as a point of contrast with sort of the, the post-scarcity society that we see in, in oh, right. Next Generation, the Federation. But they were never, again, believable or deep. And then by adding a Ferengi to Deep Space Nine, it gave them their first chance to really dive into mm-hmm. Ferengi culture and amazingly salvaged that culture and made them actually interesting and fun. The Ferengi episodes were typically still the lighter, more uh, humorous episodes, but they did an amazing job of, because of Armin Shimmerman, who played Quark, okay. just brought out this incredible performance that even people who hated and loathed Ferengi from Next Gen, right. like, you love Quark, <laughs> you and you love, love like you know the, that balance of you know a, a culture that's all about looking for the profit, but yep. you know there's still the morals, the the right, the but they're, they're still people. They're still people, right? Which which uh, that was so interesting because. Because what we do is we the the humor came in sort of the caricature of the greed, and then the humanity or came of it or the the peoplehood of of the character came when we get to see sort of motivations and him with his kids and a mm-hmm. cousin or some you know like the family stuff yes right and and then there's you know and so his uh, his uh, brother was Rom who was uh, sort of a flunky for him for the first few seasons. But uh-huh. as time goes on, we actually find that Rom actually is a very talented engineer. And he moves out under from under his brother's shadow. He actually starts working for the station and becomes a valued part of the, the station's oh, okay. engineering crew. Uh, and his son, Nog, again, is just... I remember Nog. Does yeah. Nog hang out with Jake? Nog hangs out with Jake. And again, <laughs> early on, the two of them just hang out and look at the girls getting off the transports. Right, right. And, uh, you, know, you know, teenager shenanigans right. that's cringeworthy now but to watch. <laughs> but again, Nog ends up in his own arc where he, he becomes... He, he wants, wants to, to go the, to Starfleet, doesn't he? The first he? Ferengi to go to Starfleet. And they actually deal with this innate racism where you know, when he first goes to Cisco, and Cisco is just dismissing this out of hand because, because he's a Ferengi. Yeah. And it was actually very powerful to watch a, you know, these episodes where Cisco catches himself and is thinking, oh my God, I am prejudging him because of right. these people. And when... Nog makes this, there's one episode where Nog makes this impassioned comment that, you know, he's like in tears, like, I don't want to end up with my dad. He's smart, he's intelligent, and he won't let himself grow past his bounds, and his brother keeps him down, and I don't want to be like my dad. Yeah. And it was, like, incredible. Like, yeah. this is this is rich. This is a deep character moment. And then, yes, he goes on. He be- joins Starfleet. He, right. he becomes... A participating right. member of later a he's conflict in the, Academy, in the war. Yeah. Right? I remember him in a, in a uniform. You know, this makes me want to watch the show again because... Well, you, you should. I, I did not, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I don't think I appreciated it enough uh, the first time I saw it. Because I, I I know I watched the first three seasons, and then they got the the ship that enabled the them... The Defiant, which enabled them to go and have adventures off the base. So the three three seasons was sort of a magical turning point for Deep, Deep Space Nine because that was the point at which a lot of the Star Trek crew shifted off of it to go to uh, to, to start development on Star Trek Voyager. Oh, okay. And when that occurred, then one of the team, Iris Stephen Bear, uh, really became the showrunner for DS9. And he's oh. the one who really had this vision of making the first step towards serialized storytelling, which Star Trek absolutely positively was not supposed to be at that point. They they wanted episodic. You can just watch oh, any monster episode. of the week, monster of the week, conflict of the week. They didn't want you to have to feel like you needed to watch an order. Okay. But Iris Stephen Bear really had this idea that we could do so much more with Star Trek, and so he came in and started weaving in this longer arc that involves the Dominion on the other side of the, the wormhole and the Gamma right. Quadrant, and the Dominion. It was it was <laughs> towards the end of the third season they put the place the, the seeds in place to drag the Federation into a war. Right. And that, again, was a very non-Star Trek idea. The Star Trek up to this point was, you know, we do the things we do to avoid this. But, right. But Deep Space Nine said, okay, you have this utopia. You have this federation. What happens when you run into another group, a powerful group, that will have none of that? Right. They aren't interested in negotiating. And they're just as powerful as you are. And they're just as powerful as you are. And they won't, they're not going to come to the negotiating table. I felt like... Deep Space Nine had that chance to say, how do we examine our values when we actually are hit with something that we can't talk our way out of? Right. And for me, that didn't undercut the values of Star Trek. It actually 
made them more real? Because I feel like when you are saying, well, no, so we have these high val- high morals and this is what we're going to do. We, we have the moral way of solving every problem. But if every problem goes away on its own easily and neatly, that right. doesn't connect to us in the world where things are hard and complicated. Yeah. And there are people who just don't, don't agree listen. with a fact or right. how, how can you navigate. So for me, Deep Space Nine made Star Trek more real and relatable because it said, you know, even the best most powerful moral system that you could imagine can have places it can't solve. And how do you still choose to approach that as a people? Tell me who the Dominion were again. So how the, did, the yeah, Dominion, what were they like? Dominion was basically the federation of the Gamma Quadrant. Okay. They, they were a collection of races, but they were one ruled by a mysterious race known as the Founders. Okay. Who basically, you know, conquered worlds and they all were part of a collective known as the Dominion. Okay. But the Founders, it turns out, so actually to go back through the characters, the the, the alien character on Deep Space Nine was, uh, the very alien character was Odo. Odo, that's right. He was he's, in a bucket. He's in a bucket, a shapeshifter, <laughs> a big pile of goo that could take on pretty much every shape except for people. He couldn't do people very well. So he looked a little melted as his costume. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he had no idea who he was or where he was from. He was just found in space near the wormhole at some point and was, you know, experimented on. Raised by the... Raised by the Cardassian, well, by a Bajoran scientist, but then he became a security agent on the Deep Space Nine station when it was still a Cardassian ore refining facility. And he actually, so his professional history spanned both the Cardassian period and the Federation period. But because oh. under the Cardassians turned to him as an enforcer because he sort of had this deep-seated uh, drive for justice mm-hmm. that both they and the Bajorans could respect. Yeah. So, and because of that, he was literally the only carryover from the Cardassian era because he wasn't a lackey of the Cardassians. He right. was always trying to do the right thing, solve the crime, bring right. stability to the station. Yeah, yeah, he was sort of a private eye kind of thing. Private he, eye. Yeah, he was, <laughs> that was a cool... Then we eventually find out that, he, uh, a big surprise, he is a founder, that these, his oh. whole people are shapeshifters, and that he was one of a um, hundred uh, foundlings uh, that were uh, baby founders that were spread through the galaxy, and as a way of them to find out more about what was going on in the rest of the galaxy. Ah, and so that if they wanted to expand, yes. they had a foothold. Exactly. But they didn't know, the, those hundred did not know that they were... Right. The, the, so they were just planted as seeds and then... And they were little, little infants dropped in the reed boat and sent down the river to... Uh, uh, right, and then one day you'd run into someone else with a melty face mm-hmm. and you'd be like, oh my God, I have to trust you because you also have a melty face. Exactly. Except for they don't know Odo. They don't know Odo. Yes. Odo, uh, he, he sees crime. He sees crime. He his sense of individual justice. They they didn't anticipate that uh, Odo it would be a character who would get through the isolation and being treated like an alien yeah. and learn to actually connect to other individuals. And so he became the only founder to really have empathy outside of their own people. Right. Because again, the founders are essentially highly xenophobic. They okay. didn't trust. They'd been mistreated by solids, as they call us in the uh, in the past. <laughs> and so their idea is, well, the way we end up not being mistreated is we just conquer them all because we're right. smarter and more powerful and we can screw with them. Right. And uh, there's some very powerful storylines that show just how much uh, havoc the founders could wreak by basically impersonating other humans. Because now full founders, they have no problem looking like other humans. Oh, really? And, I, and impersonating. And, and there's a point at which they... They basically send the government of Earth into chaos by infiltrating at key points and establishing a martial law and power outages. And there's a point at which Cisco meets with one of these founders, and they said, "So, how many founders do you think are on Earth right now?" So, right. I so I don't know. So, there's six of us. Six of us brought your planet down. Oh my God! Know? And it was this very creepy idea of of. Yeah. They would could partly conquer because they had Jem'Hadar soldiers, their 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 troops. They had their Vorta, who were uh, their their sort of military leaders, but really smarmy diplomatish okay. characters. Very fun. Um, they uh, <laughs> and but but part of what they did was they just got people to tear themselves apart by just taking so over this leader or that that uh, uh, scientist and having them sow discord and, and wow. ha- let things tear apart from the inside. 
Okay, so that's the founders, and there's not that many of them. I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot of them, but they're mostly off in their their great link and on their home world back in the uh, Gamma Quadrant. And okay, they, uh, and so it just a handful ever came through the wormhole yeah. and led the wrecking of the Federation during that conflict. Wow! And so does the amazing f- story, but that all this all. St- starts to happen right at the end of the third season. They start laying the seeds that, and that was, for me, I, I was going along, not a big fan of DS9, and then towards right. the end, there's this two-parter where they finally meet the founders, and suddenly everything like gets tweaked around. Right. And I suddenly thought, oh my God, this is incredible. And this is the point that really where Iris Stephen Bear, his vision of what we can do here really okay. came to bear. And then really the best part of the series is like the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh seasons where they really lead through this thing that they've never done, a, a, a serialized storytelling through Star Trek, which was okay because at that point, Next Gen was gone yep. and Voyager was going on, but Voyager was happening in the, you know, the Delta Quadrant, another whole other sector of the galaxy. Right, right. And so there was no other Star Trek really going on that had to match and the, the beat of like, oh, you know, right. we've, we've pulled the Federation to a complete war. Right. And, and there were no movies at that time either. So there were movies, and they kind of just ignored it briefly. Like like Star Trek: First Contact occurred during this run, um, and they needed Worf. So Worf actually joined the Deep Space Nine crew after Next Generation wrapped up. Yep. And so he was part of DS Nine for the last run. But when they did say Star Trek: First Contact, they needed to bring Worf back. And so without any explanation or acknowledgement, DS Nine he takes the Defiant. And he's off flying, attacking the Borg cube oh, with wow. the rest of the the <laughs> fleet at the beginning, and gets beamed off at the end. And and then. And at the end, he just quietly goes back to DS9. So apparently, the Borg attacked Earth during DS9, and and no one noticed at Bajor. Nobody <laughs> noticed. Yeah, Bajor and the Cardassian. <laughs> that is insane. Do you realize how hard it is for me to say Cardassian? Uh, I know. Uh, Do you realize how hard it is for me to say Cardassian? Right. Uh, uh, I only know, I only lean towards Kardashian because every couple of weeks someone will uh, tell a joke about my last name. And uh, it's brutal and uh, and yet uh, incessant. <laughs> and so there's no getting away from it. Talk to me, is there a holodeck on DS9? I can't remember. There are holo suites on DS9 and they are, uh, they're, uh, again, this is all things that were retrofitted on to this Kardashian station that yeah. they're, they're, they're uh, you know, they're constantly fighting with. It's, it's, it's all Cardassian tech, and they're trying to like federationize as much as they can. Right. But Quark runs the Hollow Suites as part of the bar that he oh, maintains right. on the station. And in fact, the whole reason he is there is that from the very beginning, Cisco basically convinces him to keep his bar there because Cisco knows that if there's going to be a community on this station, the, the people need a place to relax and kick right. back and, uh, and yes, even gamble, the, mm-hmm. the Dabo kind of like roulette. But you know, of course, in, in Quark's world, Hollow Suites are all about uh, renting them out to what Whatever crazy fantasies people oh, might sexy have. Times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I believe there was a, uh, a Vulcan Love Slave series that were particularly popular <laughs> among his uh, his clientele. Yes. Uh, so yeah, the, there's definitely a lot in the Hollow Suites that you sort of feel like I I, I really hope they just like steam purge those every time. <laughs> like I, I I'm not sure I'd want to go in just right after somebody no. else left. <laughs> no. Do we do we have any idea who the worker bees are on Deep Space Nine? Like who who. Are, is there a, a a subclass of of people that are being paid poorly? You know, it, this is the Federation moving in, so they're, they're not supposed to be being paid poorly. Yeah, right? yeah. There are a lot of Bajoran workers who now willingly come to the station. I mean, it used to be that – see, when the Cardassians ruled, the Bajorans were slaves, slave right. labor for their mining and processing. That's, That's right. what this station did. So it represented something very negative to the Bajoran people. But as the Federation moved in, they were trying to lead the Bajoran people to membership in the Federation, right? Bajorans would come willingly to work and be part of the station and the commerce that occurs there and right. the engineering teams that kind of keep the station running. Cool. Uh, but but yeah, we but hitting down the, the cast again, some of the other characters, we... Um, uh, so one thing that actually left me cold in Next Generation is that there was no scientist character on Next Generation. Well, there was you just know, Spock whole... was such a big deal for me as, yeah. as growing up as you know, science is blue. Right. The only blue on Next Gen was the psychologist mm-hmm. and the doctor. And he's a hologram. Oh, no, no, no. That you're thinking Voyager. I'm thinking Next, Next Generation oh. was Beverly Crusher. Oh, Beverly Crusher. Yeah, right? yeah. So Deanna Troy was the psychologist, the therapist. Oh, right. The empath. But the, she almost never wore her uniform anyway. Right. Uh, uh, and then Beverly Crusher. Was, they didn't have a character representing the scientist. They, right. They diffused that across other characters. For me, that was a big negative because I found Spock inspirational as a kid. Right. And having science removed explicitly 
uh, even though they dealt with it all the time on the right. show, still felt like a, a kind of a slap in the face. Yeah. So one thing that delighted me about Deep Space Nine is they had a science officer. For some reason, this commerce station had a science officer. Who was the science officer? Uh, Jedzia Dax. 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 So That's right. She is the uh, the Trill character, uh, the That's... species they had introduced in an episode of Next Generation. Turns younger and younger. No, she uh, she's a symbiotic species. She uh, she is a, a a member of her race, oh, the Trill. Right. She's humanoid, but there is this 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 bug in her in her stomach. That's right. The Trill symbiote that has the a, sort of a joined personality with her, and so in the in, in Trill society, those who are joined. Uh, they, the individuals, they're just like us, right? They, they train right. to be ready for that point where a symbiote comes in, and that symbiote carries with it the memory of all the other lifetimes it's experienced in other hosts That's leading up. That's right. And so you have the personality of the host is still strong and part of it, but it right. merges with the personality of the symbiote. And, and the hundred people yeah, that the, it was... I think it was like eight or so lives that... Was right, because the trills eventually died. Or not the trills, but the symbiotes actually died too no, no, sometimes, the, right? Or, eventually, yeah. The, yeah. the hosts would die first, and the symbiotes could live hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay. But, the, but when the host died, the most important thing was saving the symbiote to pass it on to the next host right. so that their life and their history would be continued. Wow. So... Doesn't she, doesn't Trill, doesn't she die? And then, spoiler alert, she spoiler makes it? Spoiler alert. She, she has a, a little run in with the, uh, with Gul Dukat, the one, the, the adversary, the uh, Cardassian adversary. We'll come to him later, I guess. But okay. uh, she is killed. And so for the final season, we meet a new Dax, a, an Ezri Dax. The, okay. uh, someone who actually, because they were trying to rush the symbiote back to Trill after Jadzia was murdered, yeah. uh, they couldn't get there in time. And there was literally only one, uh, one Trill on the ship available for joining. She had not been trained to be joined. She never planned to. And right. so she ends up trying to cope with this. And she oh. was actually a lovely character in the final season. I, oh, cool. I, I, I actually, as much as I loved Jadzia Dax, I also really enjoyed that opportunity to see like, Expand on what is it like? What you didn't want to, you weren't planning on, and all of a sudden now you're not exactly you anymore, and you have all of this to draw on. Yeah, yeah. So that was a a fantastic character arc for her. But again, it was so good. She was also a a counselor. So at the very end, we lose our scientist and we go back to our our, our (laughs) counselor. But she does some good therapy in the last season, so it it, it plays out well. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> so then we have um, Dr. Bashir is the uh, Federation doctor on the station. Right. Uh, 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 Who played that? Do you Alan, remember? Alexander Sadig, though he later uh, reverts more to his his original uh, Sadig El Fadel, who's a, a, a Middle Eastern performer. He was actually also on Game of Thrones as the Dorn uh, King. Oh, okay. Who gets <clears throat> spoilers killed because you know Game of Thrones? Uh, Game killed. of Thrones. Everyone's dead. Yeah, and. Um, he establishes a friendship early on in the series with Garrick, the only Cardassian left on the station, who is a but a simple tailor. He runs a tailor shop down on the promenade. And the spy. And the spy. That's and, right. Uh, and a game they play with him for years of who is he and why is he here? And is there, he, he seems to know things he shouldn't know and he right, has he's connections. He's just a simple tailor. <laughs> just, just plain simple Garak. <laughs> Literally my favorite character on the series. Oh, really? He is so. Um, Andrew Robertson play, does such a good job with that character, playing the nuanced vagueness for so many years. And then eventually we do learn he was part of the. the uh, uh, the, the Obsidian Order, the the Cardassians, uh, uh, Black Ops, effectively oh, intelligence, okay. secret intelligence organization, again had a very dark past. Yeah, uh, you know this, that whole war with Bajor and Carda- uh, Cardassia. What Cardassia, would it, be? it would be yeah. okay. Um, was incredibly dark, and oh, I yeah. remember thinking that it didn't it didn't feel right but but I think I could handle it now cuz I I think I just I popped in and out of it I liked Voyager more yeah and um and you know there were any number of reasons but it, but it was but this sounds like this this has some real meat to it that's that's what I love about it yeah it it really had the most interesting character arcs of really any of the Star Trek series were there any Vulcans date. at any uh, point just as incidental characters who pop in for for an episode like, here and there, right? Just delivering paperwork or right. something. Yeah, they and... <laughs> uh, they were still kind of <laughs> keeping away from the the Vulcan. They wanted to really explore some of these other races and really yeah. develop some of these species more interestingly. Um, the and you know and so Garrick, once we find out what his history is, he follows a very interesting art because you know this is a guy who basically would torture people to death for information right. in service of the Cardassian state. 
but he follows an arc as with his exposure to the Federation. He becomes an ally and he becomes an instrument of change for his own people. Okay. And that, again, powerful, powerful arc. Yeah. Contrast that with his uh, superior um, uh, who had run the station before, um, uh, uh, Gul Dukat. Again, Gul Dukat. Fantastic that was his name. performance. Mark Alimo, I believe, is the actor. Yeah, uh, that guy was terrifying. He was terrifying. And he was there beginning <laughs> to end. That. He, the, the, the trajectory on his character is so amazingly complicated and nuanced. But again, villains are only interesting if they are relatable and you understand at least partly why they're doing what they're doing mm-hmm. and see what their tragic flaws are. And the fact that this is a, you know, a, just a horrifically bad person who had this, this issue that he felt like the Bajorans never appreciated what he was doing for them. Right. The, you know, it, it his, just completely, it, it was an insane theory that he completely bought into. Exactly. He, yeah. he, he loved the Bajoran. He, his, he had a Bajoran mistress. Right. And a half Bajoran daughter right. that, that he had hid away, but then later embraced. And it's all this bizarrely complicated need to be loved for all the horrific things that he had done right. and falling in and out of favor with the government and then becoming, uh, you know, his, 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 the complexity of where he ends up <laughs> right. finally in uh, spoilers, he, he ends up like masquerading as Bajoran towards the end of the series wow. uh, and is just twisted and fantastic, but he never delivers a bad line of dialogue. <laughs> Every time that, that Dukat is on screen, it's fascinating. And the, the interplay, the, the, the psychology of that, these interplay is so right. engaging, especially later on in the series. This, the writers, was the writing team, did it change much over the seven years to your, to your knowledge or, uh, you know, there's always a little bit of flux, but there's a core group of writers that really stayed all the way through. Okay. And honestly, any episode that was written by um, uh, Robert Hewitt Wolf and Iris Stephen Bear, mm-hmm. those are always my favorite episodes because they were the ones that not only would there be an interesting arc beginning to end, but they would be also the episodes where there would be these moments where like two characters mm-hmm. just get a moment together. And you always get like these beautiful little things that, that illuminate a, a, That's so some cool. aspect of it. There's one of my favorite scenes of all DS9 ends up, there's a point where, you know, there, there are worried that the station's going to get conquered and you have Garrick with uh, Quark in the bar. So the two non-Federation characters. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and Quark says, okay, Garrick, here, try this drink. And uh, <laughs> Garrick sips it and it's like, oh, that's vile. It's so sweet and cloying. <laughs> and, and, uh, Gar- uh, and Quark says, yes, it's a human drink. It's root beer. It's like, <sighs> oh. And then he uh, takes another sip and it's like, but you know, once you drink it, you start to get used to it and mm-hmm. you almost like it. And then I'm thinking, <laughs> like the Federation? And uh, Quark is like, yeah, like the Federation. Wow. And then finally there's this moment of, do you think they're going to get us out of this? And it's like, <laughs> you know, we better hope so. You know, oh, and so right, it was right. this, this moment, these two characters just hating the Federation, hating everything, but this through the tool of root beer, right. it becomes this incredible metaphor for how their worldviews have it's been a, changed. That is a classic, disco- that, that's like a classic Star Trek kind of thing. It where is. Where they take something simple like Earl Grey tea or, uh, you know, back in the original Star Trek, so there were, there were these things where Bones would explain something, you know, well, this is what humans are like and that's why we're great. <laughs> and then, you know, the Vulcans would be, and Spock would be like, I see why you are a good people. Yes. And it was it was always it was root beer. It was consistently uh some of those great scenes were 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 consistently root beer. Yep. What um what were your other favorite scenes? Cuz that that's that's an excellent question. Well, oh gosh, there's uh, one of my favorite um series of episodes is yeah. there's a point in the series where they basically they lose deep space 9. The, the station is conquered. The Dominion takes it over. Ooh. And that was the season finale cliffhanger. Right. The uh, uh, Cisco, uh, uh, you know, the Federation has to abandon. And a lot of things are in play there. At this point, his son, Jake, wants to be a reporter. So okay. Jake actually chooses to stay behind to be a wartime correspondent wow. and freaks his dad out. But right. He, you know, he can't stop him. Mm-hmm. And, um, but all the, 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 the Bajorans, well, a lot of the Bajorans leave, but like, you know, Quark stays, the... Oh, Cardiff. does Odo stay? Actually, Garrick goes with the Federation because he is persona non grata with the Cardassians. So right. he has to leave. Odo stays. Okay. Uh, Kira stays uh, as the Bajoran representation of there. But the Federation presence is uh, driven out. Right. And 
this is again a case where the studio basically wanted okay and then the first episode next season they'll take it back and it's over and this is where iris steve mirror like really pushed and there's a full six episode span where ds9 is under cardassian uh, and uh, dominion rule because the dominion actually pairs up with the cardassians oh that's and, it and they give it to the cardassian yeah and yeah. um and you see then the cardassians who are used to ruling being played as puppets of the dominion and the interesting conflicts ah. that go on there because you know they're rankling against this but they have to do what their ma- their masters say now right and it's a very complex set of interactions uh, but yeah, they took a full six episodes to then finally return, and it was. Are there twenty two episodes per season? Like uh, normal, I think or? it was might have been twenty six for Deep Space Nine. This is back in the early days when the full season was you know Longer. half a year or twenty six. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was but that was brilliant. Like you'd never seen this in Star Trek that a storyline actually continued and it was expanded yeah. out over many episodes, and it culminated in this you know great. Starship battle that like you had never seen the likes of because this is when Star Trek also made the shift to CG visual effects ah. from just standard model work, which is very limiting and very expensive to make new models. Mm-hmm. You know they so this was the first time in Star Trek you'd ever seen like you know fleets of hundreds of ships come into conflict with one another in right. this spectacular battle and because they you know, could. I love what, my sh- I, I love my ships blowing up. You love your so. ships. That was one of your previous. I'm with Robert Hurt by the way. People should know there's two other episodes with you that people should listen to, but it's at Astro Rob on Twitter. He's never there. And at <laughs> Astro Rob LA on Instagram, he's not there either. Uh, but uh, universeunplugged.org has uh, videos and stuff, and we'll talk about that uh, near the end. But yeah. um, so, uh, the sh- so all the ships come. What year did DS9 run? Do you remember? Oh, I would have to pull out my phone and uh, Take a get quick IMDb. Look? But it was roughly 93, I think, was when it began its run. Uh, then... Um, uh, yeah, and it continued on and uh, overlapped with Voyager. Voyager then continued after the end of DS9. So, uh, and it was for some seasons. Yeah, I believe it was 93 was the first year. Yeah, so, so it was the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but the switch to CG gave them this opportunity to sort of do things much Bigger. more expansively than yeah. they had done on Star Trek. Odo is a character that required CG every time he did a transformation. Oh, and right. And so, uh, you know, whereas uh, CG was very, very rare in uh, Next Generation, mm-hmm. you know, it became much more common. It's sadly actually one of the reasons that DS9 has never been uh, put on, uh, has been up to high definition like Next Generation was. Okay. Next Gen was all, all the visual effects were pretty much shot on film. And so they just were able to recomposite that at HD, HD res- resolution. DS9, that's true for about the first three seasons or so, but after that, it's more and more CG that would have to be just completely rebuilt from the ground up. As, wow. And so that's been a, a stumbling block in getting a nice high-def version of that. Okay. Which is so sad. I'd love to see more of that. But um, uh, the, in fact, but, there's a the documentary coming out soon, uh, uh, maybe out by the time this goes on, called uh, What We Left Behind. Uh, and there they did invest. There was a fan, it was a Kickstarter thing. Yeah. And fans kicked in money. They actually have converted scenes here and there and sequences into HD to give that sense of what the HD DS9 would be. Wait, so it's a documentary just about DS9? About DS9. About, wow. And What We Left Behind is what it's called? Yes, and because the final episode of DS9 was called What We Leave Behind. Oh. And I may have gotten those two reversed, but it's something <laughs> play on the It's one of those. Yeah, it's one of those. And uh, that's, uh, Wow. Okay. Holy smokes! Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of meat in this show, and yeah, the uh, let's see who else. Uh, just hit the other characters. Um, uh, Chief Miles O'Brien was actually the carryover from Next Generation. Uh, he was the transporter officer in Next Generation, and he the red haired guy. Uh, yeah, the uh, the. Uh, 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 was he Irish? Irish, yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's looking I for that. Believe him. Not Scottish. Irish. <laughs> not, yeah, not Scottish and not English for sure. Yeah. So he but, becomes sort of the, the engineer on and DS9. And he is married to an Asian named Keiko. Keiko. That's it. Yeah. So they got and, married on Next Generation, and so it, we see a little bit of what family life, yes. the strains of family life, is. I will have to say that I don't think their family. Uh, it, experiences were terribly well portrayed it was very it was not very well written it no. was just it they they spent more time looking into the alien races than they did about this couple i feel like i feel like this is the example of what happens when you have a lot of single guys trying to write <laughs> stories about married couples it's yeah yeah it falls, it falls a little flat there yeah, but there uh, might be there might be some issues but it's uh, good the uh, I, um the actor, though, who plays Miles, does a fantastic job with him, and I'm completely blanking on his name off the top of my head. But right. it's interesting because in every other show he's in, he is always a villain. 
Oh, really? Yeah, he was he was like a recurring villain in, in Stargate, Atlantis. He always plays these dark, violent, mean roles. And so okay. this was like a lovely chance. Like, this is what he's like as a good guy. <laughs> right. You know who, um, who, who reminded me of him, but was not the same actor at all, was the guy in Guardians of the Galaxy who worked for the Nova Corps. And, oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Just, very, very similar. Actually, just has sort of that b- sort of broad, freckle face kind of look to him, and I was like, "Is that the?" And then I thought, "No," <laughs> and I am correct. It was not him. Anyway, so those two, and then um, another of my absolute favorite characters, who's a sub- recurring character, was um, one of the Dominion characters known as Wei Yun. Okay, he is this race called the Vorta, and they're sort of the lieutenant. They're, they're, they're the uh, the generals for the founders. They're okay. a, a genetically engineered race that are basically completely subservient to the founders because they are genetically engineered to think of the founders as gods. Oh, interesting. And they, they cannot see them in any other way. And uh, they are clones. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but they're one clones? Of, they're clones. And, of course, that wasn't established until they, uh, they'd cast um, – one actor to play one of the, uh, the, uh, the these these Vorta called Wei Yun, and who is a simpering like, oh yes, anything you say, founder. And, <laughs> you know that sort of sweet talking. He sounds smooth, and obviously he wants to make everything good. And as soon as you turn around, he will stab you in the back right. because it is his imperative to. And he was um, uh, so good in that role that after they killed his character, they realized, oh, we can't not have Wei Yun. So they bring him back. And say, oh well. I'm Wei Yun Four. You know, we're we're a, a line of clones. I'm very proud of my my line. You know, and so they oh, okay. so they keep killing off Wei Yuns and bringing in more oh, Wei Yuns as, as the series goes that on. That is so great. But um, <laughs> uh, the um, the the actor who plays Wei Yun, he actually uh, got his start in. Um, uh, uh, Cthulhu stories. The, he played the reanimator, the scientist and reanimator. Okay. And uh, because I'm terrible with um, names, I'm actually blanking on that right now. I'll see if IMDb can come to my uh, my rescue while I... Uh, uh, Jeffrey started, Combs. Jeffrey. Jeffrey Combs. Wow. Brilliant. He has played multiple species in Star Trek over the yes. years. And every single character he's ever played in Star Trek has been brilliant. Yeah. He actually played multiple races in Deep Space Nine. He also plays a Ferengi um, named Brunt, who's a, a, a like a politician uh, negotiator. There's even an episode where... In Deep where, Space Nine? There's even an episode in Deep Space Nine where Wei Yun and Brunt are in the same episode. Oh, my but God. But they never actually cross paths because <laughs> completely different makeup jobs. You know? And uh, he's casting. so good at it, I didn't even know it at the time that it wow. was the same guy, right? <laughs> wow. That is so cool. That is a lot of con signing. He can sign a lot of photos. Oh, absolutely! At a yeah, he he also played the Andorian character Shran in Star Trek Enterprise, who is okay. one of the best recurring characters in Enterprise as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's Th- he's that's in, with Scott Bakula. That was Scott Bakula. Yeah, yeah. which yeah, uh, incredibly I, talented. And you know, I I I only watched the first season of that one of Enterprise. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, uh, but I always liked Quantum Leap. Yeah. And <laughs> Enterprise was. I didn't warm up to that until the third season. Okay, well, how I, many seasons of that? Four. That one only made okay. it for four seasons. And then mm-hmm. there was the great Star Trek uh, desert after that for a there while. There was for a while. But uh, the I actually, I argue the fourth season of Enterprise is one of the strongest seasons of next, of any Star Trek. Uh, okay. It's, it's actually really, really good. But well, it did a cool. lot of, um, call it either fan service or just world building. It called back to a lot of the themes from the original series. And it went back, because it's a prequel to the original series. Could you just watch the fourth S- oh, absolutely. Season, you can just jump in and watch the fourth season. You'll miss a little bit of the character arc of how the Vulcan characters starts to have a kind of a romantic connection to the uh, engineer. That starts to happen in the third season. Right. But but, but you'll jump in and you'll yeah. get used to it. You're yeah. like, oh, they're dating. Yeah, they and- did a lot of um, uh, two or three episode story arcs, but okay. a lot of it ties to things that were then leading into things that happen in Next Generation, and, or in, in, in the original series, I mean. So what about... Um, well, I mean, we've we about 10 minutes left. Mm-hmm. So I just want to say that uh, what about Discovery? And, and that and the, because it was Deep Space Nine and Voyager, and then there was nothing for a while. Right. Then we got the J.J. Abrams movies that right. I'm not that big of a personal fan of. There's trouble. There's, There's trouble, trouble there sometimes. Them. And um, they felt more like Star Wars movies to me than Star Trek movies. They, they did. And, then, and I love Star Wars, but not in my Star Trek. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a plot person, and it's like each of the J.J. movies, you tend to walk out and think, 
okay, that didn't actually make any sense whatsoever. Right. You know, lots I mean, of glitzy things they happen. They weren't even great They're Star fun. Wars movies. They're fun at the yeah. moment, but then, you know, I, I do like my stories to kind of make sense at the end a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I don't own any of the DVDs. It's yeah. a sign. It's a bad sign <laughs> if I'm not buying the DVDs because I'm still buying DVDs because yeah. that, that's what I'm like. But... um so, but Discovery, I saw the first season. I have not yet seen the second season. Oh, okay. Well, I think you're in for a treat. I think the... the uh... Because I loved... It was weird, the first season of Discovery. It became Star Trek at the end of the first season. Of exactly. Discovery. And that was a tough thing. I think it got a lot of dings. And, and not unreasonably so, that it felt like, where is the morality? Where, where are the right. ideals that we this look for in Star Trek? This is mediocre people in space, is what it felt like. It really did. But at and the end... Set, where, where is it set? Is it set in between... It, it's set before the original series, yeah, it's right? it's set about 10 years before the original series, but then that's some large chunk of time after Enterprise. Yeah. So uh, so it's, it's kind of in that continuity... Uh, it is part of what we call the prime universe. It's not part of the J.J. Kelvin timeline where they, okay. that was sort of like J.J.'s well, thing changes a little bit of history and then that's a different storyline. It mm-hmm. doesn't have to end up where, where we expect it to. Thank but God. yeah, but it's, it was the first return to sort of what we call the prime universe. Um, and it's again, filling in some of these gaps in history that, that are there. And you're right. It took a while to come back, but I, I loved the note that it ended on because I think it's, and, but it was it also, it really was amazing. Unlike, yeah, anything except maybe the third season of Enterprise. It was really the first attempt to do true serialized storytelling. That yeah. you know, this is just um, you know fourteen episode story, and that was part of why that it wanted to lead us to that point, that mm-hmm. reminding us of of what and we should are, be doing. And, and there's two seasons so and far, that, right? right? A second season is out, and this the, in the second season it actually introduces um, Captain Pike, who is the captain before Kirk, right? And Spock, who was on the Enterprise before he serves with Kirk. And, That's right. And so uh, it basically is the, the original pilot for Star Trek was Captain Pike and Spock and number one. And so this actually intersects the discovery with the Enterprise of that era. Yeah. And it brings Captain Pike on board to be their sort of captain of the season. Uh, yep. And it's like fantastic casting. Um, Anson Mount does a just a brilliant job as Captain Pike. Really, and um, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, blanking again. Uh, Spock is actually played by um, yeah. Ethan Peck, Ethan, uh, Gregory okay. Peck's son, and what? really really owns that role oh, beautifully. That's so cool. And so they they come in to provide sort of a counter to what's the characters that are already well established on yeah. discovery. It, it's still Michael Burnham's show, yeah. you know, right. And it's, but it's now brings a whole new dynamic of the evolution of her character right. and this, this intersection. Now she has to, uh, she has to fit into this new team. Right. Yeah, she Is has that... to fit into this new team and it changes the whole dynamic of the show. Right. Cause you know, their previous captain was, you know, an uh, evil creature from a mirror universe. So, so, right. you know, they, they were looking for, they didn't have anyone to step into that role on that ship. Right. And so it's like, mm-hmm. well, he needs to fill in and establishes a new uh, right. uh, uh, conflict. Uh, I'm actually going to edit that out about the evil, uh, the mirror. Oh, oh, spoilers. Just because uh, that one's too new. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. No spoiler warning, right? Hey, uh, guys, I just edited out uh, a thing that uh, we both, we were, we got so excited. Uh, I spoiled something and I didn't you, want to. You didn't want to. And I'm okay with spoiling Deep Space Nine because it's a hundred years old. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Discovery, uh, you should watch that first season and the reveal at the end is fantastic and amazing. So I recommend it. Uh, it was it was hard to watch initially because I was like, "What is happening with these mediocre humans, and these bastards?" And then uh, and then the exciting things that happen and how they grow. I was like, "I don't care. No. I don't care that these the 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 what it was is we watched them rise to the occasion, right? Yes. The uh, the M- Michael Burnham's um, roommate. On yeah, the, Tilly. On, Tilly is uh, such a great character. I freaking love that character. She in brings that first so much, season. so much enthusiasm for for science and for what she's doing, and that that is the thing that I feel like Star Trek needs to always be about. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, uh, you know the interaction between her and and uh, Paul Stamets, who's the scientist who's developing this new technology that they leverage in the, in oh, the, yeah, in the show, yeah. uh, and frankly, so freaking overdue in Star Trek to actually have any hint of LGBT representation. Right. And, uh, you know, I, it's one of the things I'm, it was I'm so someone powerful. who came out so late in life. I, I didn't come out to like my early thirties. Yeah. And I feel like if I had been able to watch a show with a character like Paul Stamets, 
you know, just a that scientist, valid, a scientist who's it, gay, this representation like this is so important for yeah. people to become comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. And uh, everyone needs someone to go, oh, I could be that. I don't have to pretend that. Tarzan found a little girl, yeah. right? Or whatever, right? Yeah. And um, which was my whole thing as a child. Uh, I was like, no, I want Tarzan to be my dad. And uh, <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a cry for help. Anyway, so, uh, but the, but yeah, it was, but that, that arc with that character, he's so, because I remember that first episode going, well, I don't like this guy at all. What is <laughs> happening here? This gentleman is a bastard. And, um, and then, like with all Star Trek, you get you get character development, you yes. get reasons, and I was so afraid that they weren't going to have reasons. Yeah, and he he you know as we learn more about Stamets and more about you know he's sort of has this research he's been wanting to do, but now he's kind of being forced to do it in ways that it wasn't necessarily how he wanted it to play out, and that's why he's so angry. It yeah. actually makes really beautiful sense, and we do see that other side of him and yeah. it's it's uh, really important and so much more with him in the in the second season too I, oh I, that's cool love, it's yeah. there's i am behind on absolutely everything we're at <laughs> least we're in we're in max sci-fi max superhero it's like i you know there's the no number, keeping up <laughs> i mean i i grew up you know i'm i'm an old fart right I, there was maybe one sci-fi show on a year at if that and it i watched sucked, the greatest and american watch hero it. and i watched it it yeah. was terrible <laughs> i did not enjoy it other people uh if you liked it good for you uh but it was not for me yeah. and i watched it anyway i was like i watched the bionic woman and i remember liking parts of it mm -hmm. same with wonder woman with linda carter I remember, and also being furious, <laughs> and uh, it was sort of like when I tried to read. Um, I loved Harry, um, uh, not Nancy Drew, but the Hardy Boys. Hardy Boys. Yeah, I loved the Hardy Boys books, but I could never read the Nancy Drew books uh -huh. because she was constantly worrying about her purse. Oh. And then, of course, <laughs> you realize, as we all have phones, you're like, if you had a purse. You would constantly be like, where the hell is my purse? Uh, so it's like your phone. And uh, so it makes sense. But it was um, it was not as compelling as right. the Hardy Boys. Right. But uh, yeah, so now like I, we are behind on probably four episodes behind on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. We'd only watch two shows. Oh. <laughs> we literally watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Discovery. Ah, uh, okay. And The Expanse, which we yes. are two seasons behind. Oh, and I'm, I'm glad you're catching up on that because right. that's that's a. I would have done The Expanse this thing because you covered it so well recently. Oh, so he did, I he did a great job. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Can only remember people's dorkdoms. Very yep. sad. And uh, no, I mean, it, I, it, Patrice and I are in the same boat. It's you know we've got though Patrice and I we have the shows that we're watching together like Agents yep. of Shield and the Expanse. We're caught up on that uh, Discovery, but then we have also the shows we get to watch on our own. Yep. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's the only way I get through anything. <laughs> well, that's it. It's I told Andy to watch like he watched Luke Cage. He did not want to see Jessica Jones. I want to see Jessica Jones. Uh, I haven't seen any of it. Um, I think you'll like it. Uh, he wanted to watch Daredevil. We watched the first season together, and I was like, terrifying. <laughs> I think D'Onofrio as Kingpin was chilling. That was very hard for me to get. I'm very sensitive to graphic, believable violence on screen. I'm okay with cartoony violence, but yeah. that was at the limit of my ability to watch and process. And it was, and it was, and I know it's incredibly well done. It's like all the shows that are incredibly well done but are very very dark yes like i don't uh for, it's not for me the new amazon prime show the boys i will not be watching mm. the boys i didn't i saw the comic book when it came out and i was like oh i don't need that uh <laughs> I, I i read uh like a incorruptible and um irredeemable mm -hmm. which were these comic books about a bad superman uh and i read red sun which was about a bad superman when it comes to bad superman i'm more along like with the tick and um, oh. uh, 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 Superion, <laughs> <you> like? <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the Amazon Prime series, you know, they introduced Superion as kind of like the bad Superman, but he, he, you know, but it's, it's funny. The tick. <laughs> it's right. the tick. He's just not very good at being Superman. Yeah. Less than a super efficient, like, I like my Nazis, buffoonish. Yes. For example, I don't like to see very, very efficient Nazis. You know, uh, I don't want any Raiders of, of the Lost Ark level Nazis. Yes. 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 All your Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, I, not, I, not into the Quentin Tarantino kind of level Nazis. Nope. No, no, I want to see Hogan's Heroes. Mm -hmm. I want to see uh, your Indiana Jones. No, we, we, we reach. Yeah, we reach on that's that. That's it. Sorry, that's a 
original series thing. Oh, know. to reach. To re- it's a, reach. What about Tanaka? Uh, <laughs> so uh, 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 Darmok and Jalad at Tanaka. Yes. Yeah, something like that. And oh shit, we are way. Pardon my. Uh, yeah, they're swearing at one hundred and one. Oh, but I, I I do some swearing, but uh, I was so proud that I hadn't sworn the whole because you were fascinating, Robert Hurt. <laughs> you are fascinating. I'll have you back again yeah. uh, to talk about because the other thing you were going to talk about was the science of color because you listened to the photo finishing episode. Yeah, and there's just uh, just as like an extension and add on to that, it got me all interested again on like the the things that I've learned over the years because of. What I do is create color images from things outside of the spectrum and diving into the physics to, of color. And right, that episode with you about uh, the the way you work with color and the space telescope. Uh, this is not exactly how it's put, but uh, I've been trying to explain how it's done. And is it is it your is there a key? Like, is there parallels, like, you know, d- distance and, and depth and uh, density and any of that? Or is it just a an artistic rendering? No, the, I mean, wow. Okay, so that is a whole podcast, and I right. can reference you to our previous one. But basically, <laughs> yes, the, the it's always tr- – it's not just a purely artistic choice. It's always motivated by trying to keep parallels and say – keep the shortest wavelengths that I'm looking at mapped to the blue channels and the longest wavelengths mapped to the red when we can. But it's modulated a little bit if there's a thing that we want you to be able to see. Depending on how you map which set of data into which color, it can make things easier or harder to actually perceive. And so there's a little bit of... Of uh, of choice, but I, mean, I argue that it's not so much an artistic choice as more a a, a logistical choice on how wh- to. Because what I love about like, this job that you've been doing for how long? Uh, over sixteen years now. Over sixteen years yeah. is that it comes. You have this astrophysicist uh, degree and background and all these things, but you also have this art background and degree. Don't you have an art degree as well? Right? No, I don't have an art degree. I've just been a hobby. Art had been my hobby from you know high school, college. Onwards. Andy's been bragging you up. Anyway, oh, so, well, that's uh, okay. That's, that's okay. It's, he, he's your. I'll friend. take an honorary degree. Exactly. And, 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 you know, it, it is an honorary degree. <laughs> you can you can have his. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but Robert Hurt, everybody, let's. Well, tell me what the habitable zone is, though, before you go. Okay. Sh- I, uh, thank you for that. I I, got, I should have segued when we touched on the expanse because. Right. Part of the things that we do at work for, um, we have a project called NASA's Universe of Learning, and we're funded to basically do science outreach, astrophysics, and find fun ways to get people interested in it. And one of our projects is a video series called uh, Universe Unplugged, where we do we try to work with celebrities and tell science stories through kind of fun ways of doing it. Right. And I had an, a fantastic opportunity to work with some cast members from The Expanse oh, to produce so some cool. videos that we call The Habitable Zone, mm-hmm. a little play on the Twilight Zone, right? but they play space explorers in mm-hmm. the future who are visiting exoplanetary systems, and they're looking for a potentially habitable world. And you know, when we do press releases about exoplanets, we talk about whether it's in the habitable zone, which is you know, basically if, if you were to put Earth at that star, is it the right distance that we would still keep our oceans? That's oh, right. what we mean. Because the Expanse does a pretty good job on the science. And Expanse does a, a very good job on the science. So they, they were, I had a chance to meet the, the cast and crew oh, on a number of opportunities. So cool. And so, so much easier to get people interested if you can actually just talk to them sometimes. Yeah. You know, uh, so um, actually Cass Anvar, who plays uh, the the Martian pilot, uh, Alex, okay. on the show, and Kara G., who plays drummer? The uh, she actually ends up uh, in command of one of the really big st- spaceships in the Expanse. And, cool. Uh, in the third season, um, they come on and play these characters, these space explorers, and we take them to. We've got two episodes out so far, uh, and each one we go to a different kind of system. We look at a different aspect of what we need to have lined up for a planet to actually be habitable. So it's fun, real science. It's it's imaginary how, worlds and real science. Yeah, and how long are each of these videos? They're only like five minutes each. They're That's quick, awesome. Easy digest. So if people go to universeunplugged.org. Yes, then they can find the videos. They can find the habitable zone. Or if you forget that, you can just look for, uh, go to YouTube and, and uh, search for, for habitable, habitable zone. It's going to be one of the, the, the Habitable. Habitable. You, you can do it, habitables. Uh, <laughs> but th- so, okay. Thank you so much for doing the dork forest robert uh, it's always a pleasure it really is <laughs> and uh, rangers you know the rules out there take care of each other my hat my hat my hat they're dancing around my hat <laughs> my hat my hat my hat well what do you think of that
If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh my God. Thank we you. why don't we just call that as the end of the show?